So uh, I'd like to begin uh, my time this morning with you all with, with, a, uh, with, with a question. And I'm going to give you just a short little amount of time to, to come up with an answer. And there are no right or wrong answers, but I'd like for you to, to, to think about it. You don't need to answer out loud. I'm not going to ask you to do that, but at least come up with an answer in your own mind. And so here's the question that I have for you. And again, I'm going to give you a minute to think of an answer or two. What is the best gift you ever received? What is the best gift you ever received? So I'll be back to that question in just a minute. But first, as, as many of you know, in in July, a group of 22 of us from Snowmass Chapel uh, traveled to the White Mountains of, of Arizona, to the White Mountain Apache uh, Indian Reservation. And it was there that we went, and our purpose was to spend time with the Apaches, but especially Apache children, one of whom is on the cover of our bulletin today. And like many Native Americans, the Apaches are faced with tremendous heartaches and struggles, perhaps more heartaches and struggles than any other subgroup in America. Published statistics from the Apache tribe in the White Mountains are really grim. For example, we learned while we were there that the suicide rate is the highest in the world among the White Mountain Apaches. And a lot of those suicides are people under the age of 25. Methamphetamine abuse is through the roof. Uh, 40 to 60 percent, depending on which study you look at, of the population is alcohol dependent. 50 percent is homeless, although that number is hidden because there's so many people cohabitating in subsistence housing in, on the reservation. Poverty is off the charts, paradoxically, so is obesity. Unemployment runs around 61 percent, and the high school or the, the post high school college rate is 1.3 three percent. Needless to say, it's a pretty tough place to grow up, one of the toughest, and I've been all over the world, and it is clearly one of the toughest. Well, our trip to the area, as, as some of you know, each afternoon included something called the Blue Bus Ministry, and the bus is literally bright blue. And the bus ministry has been running for about 15 years, so when children on the reservation see this blue bus coming, they know what to expect. They go running toward it. And the bus travels around the reservation, and kids run toward the bus, and then they get on the bus. And then when the bus is full, it goes to a location on the reservation that's out of traffic, that's safe, and parks where uh, the ministry, the Blue Bus Ministry, engages in what's known as the three Ps, prayer, praise, and play. A little bit of time praying, a little bit of time praising, and a lot of time playing. But it was during our worship time one afternoon that all of us, I think, were really stunned by something. Sharla was sitting with about 30, Sharla is our director of children, youth, and families, um, and she's not here today, but she was sitting on the ground, uh, staff was around her standing up, there were about 30 children sitting on the ground next to her, next to the bus, and after singing a song or two with them, Sharla started off with a, with a Bible lesson, but before she got to the lesson, she said, kids, I have a question for you. What's the best gift you've ever received? There was no pause, and there was no hesitation. The kids said things like, God, life, love, my brother, these mountains. And what struck us and surprised us, actually, is that not one child said anything about a thing. Nothing material was mentioned. All of their answers were about God and love and life. And what was common about all of their diverse answers is that none of them are things that can be purchased. And Charlotte and I, along with the rest of our group, who heard their answers, looked at each other in amazement, and I thought, you know, I need to take these kids back to Aspen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
because they really have something to teach us. And Sharla repeated the same question on different days and on, in different parts of the reservation, and the children's answers were exactly the same. They had not been coached. Instead, life had taught them a critical truth for all of us to understand, embrace, and live by. And isn't it ironic that the ones who on the surface have the least seemingly understand the most? And not only that, and this really blew me away, not once during our time with the children in any of the spots, not once did we hear a complaint. Now, this doesn't mean they don't ever complain. It's just we didn't hear it. And I'm not sure about you, but I have never spent time with a group of children for an hour or more and not heard a complaint. And frankly, I have to say, I don't think I've ever spent an hour or more with a group of adults <laughs> and not heard a complaint or a grumble. And sadly, it's sometimes been me doing the moaning. Now, please don't get me wrong. Some things in life are worth grumbling about. Life-threatening illnesses, betrayal, loss, out-of-control violence, sustained joblessness, abuse, children getting hurt, a polluted planet, and a whole host of other things are worthy of an occasional, at least, complaint or two. And I know when rotten stuff happens, I grumble. We are, after all, human beings. But that's not the point. While some complaining in life is okay, and you and I as followers of Jesus are called absolutely to right wrongs and not stick our head in the sand, there's something critical for us to keep in mind. You see, I think that the biblical story, and through the biblical story, that God wants us to know that who we are and how we live and how we approach each day depends not only where we invest our energy, but how we make a choice to see things. God, and God makes it clear in Scripture, that God calls us to be attentive and to remember that perspective is a matter of choice. And if we don't manage our own perspectives and how we see things, we can easily turn into a complaining, whining bunch. One of the great and familiar stories in Scripture that a lot of you know is a story that's found in Exodus in which the people of God are led by Moses and cross the Red Sea into the wilderness. It's an incredible story of how God can liberate us and get us out of the toughest of circumstances. But embedded within this well-known story is something else. After saving the people from misery, suffering, and certain destruction, the people of God are wandering around the wilderness on their way to the Promised Land. And two months into the journey, there is this excerpt from the book of Exodus. In the second month after they had left Egypt, the whole company of Israel complained. They said, why didn't God let us die? In Egypt we had lamb and stew and all the bread we could eat. How quickly... They forgot reality. And in response to their, God, their complaint, God says, I'm going to rain down bread from the skies for you. And as the story goes, God sends the people manna, or bread from heaven. Now, this is interesting. A lot of you know this. Some of you may not. But the word manna literally means, what is it? So God rained down, what is it? You see the people wandering around? What is it? <laughs> Sounds like it could lead to a really classic British comedy skit. What is it? <laughs> and scripture tells us that this what is it looked like coriander seed and tasted like a cracker with honey on it. And what is astounding is that soon after God gives them what is it, they again begin to complain about, to God about their lot in life. They have everything they need, but they complain. And for the next 40 years in the wilderness, not only do the people frequently ignore God 
not thank God for what God has done, but they do many things that God asks them not to do. God gives, the people complain. God provides, the people gripe. God loves, the people act as if God doesn't exist. And the cycle goes on and on and on and on and on. And then we run smack dab into our reading today from the Gospel of John. First, a little bit of background. On the day before the events in our reading today, just on the day before, Jesus feeds 5,000 people with, more than 5,000 people, he feeds thousands of people with bread, five loaves, a couple of fish. And after that event, he's tired, so he goes up to a mountain. He wants to be by himself. And then as he's up on the mountain in the evening, his disciples go out on the Sea of Galilee, and they get into a storm, and Jesus comes walking across the sea to them. And they make their way to the other shore across the Sea of Galilee, What's well, the next day that large crowds went out searching for Jesus, and they find him, and that's where we are in our reading today. And in excerpts from the sixth chapter of John, this is what happened. It reads, Jesus says, you've come looking for me because you saw God in my actions of feeding thousands with just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Don't waste your energy striving for perishable food like that. Work for food that gives you lasting life that I can give you. Jesus said, Moses gave you bread from heaven in the wilderness. Now God is offering you the real bread. I am the real bread. Whoever believes in me has life, eternal life. I am the bread of life. Jesus said, your ancestors ate manna in the desert. They eventually died. But I am the living bread, and anyone eating this bread will not die but have eternal life. So what's Jesus saying? He's saying a lot of things, but he he is saying that he, Jesus, is the one that is going to quench our deep hunger. Not the kind of hunger that comes from our stomachs, but the kind of hunger that stems from our sense of longing, searching, and seeking. The kind of hunger that causes us to look for more than what we've already got. We all have physical needs. We all have a deeper need for God. And Jesus is saying, look, I'm the answer for your quest to continually find more and get more. I'm your answer to the meaning of life, the purpose of life. I am the gateway, in fact, also to eternity. And after Jesus says all of this, the scripture tells us that the people start fighting among themselves, bickering and complaining. Just like their ancestors did in the wilderness. And this cycle that started with, in the desert with Moses continued with Jesus. God provides. People complain. God offers life. People bicker. God says, you have eternity in me. People ignore God, or worse. You know, when you get right down to it, and what is extraordinary is that God continues to give each of us manna. There's what is it all around us. And while the what is it or the manna that we are given by God may not taste like honey crackers in the desert, the list of manna that God gives you and me is extraordinary and tremendously underappreciated by people in our culture. Here's some of the manna or the what is it that God has given you. You are created and born. You get to be born. How often do you wake up in the morning and think, I get to be born. I'm alive. This gig called life, I'm experiencing. When you take a breath, do you know that's what is it? That's manna. If you think it's pure biology, you're kidding yourself. You're breathing because of God. You were given senses. Many of us are blessed with senses, our five senses, to not only experience creation, but each other. Have you ever noticed what a joy it is to look at the diversity of humankind and to have the senses to experience it? Your innate and inborn skills and talents. 
They're not yours, they're God-given. Sure, you've worked hard to master them, but where do you think they came from? Music. Aspen Music Festival, it's not about music. It's about the gifts that God has given people. Art, everything. We're given hearts. We're given the gift of love. And then on top of all this, you get eternity. So that when you die, you get to transition, and we get to transition to a whole new way of being with God, and we get to be with those we love and miss and currently see no longer. So if God gives us this, which is what this little girl understood, there's some more questions for us to think about. What's enough? What more do we want? What more do we expect from God? Now I need to emphasize again that I am not speaking this morning to the inner city mother whose child was just gunned down. I'm not speaking right now to the child who was just abused. I'm not speaking right now to the Syrians who are suffering from a supposed medical school graduate and his actions. I'm not speaking to the person right now whose spouse didn't come home last night because that spouse was drugged up or in the arms of another. I'm not speaking to all of the other sources of agony that you and I and others endure. It's not this pain that this reading is addressing. I'm not speaking to those spaces. But that said, and given all the gifts that I've mentioned, what more do we really want? Like the people of Israel and Egypt, we have struggles, things that oppress and distress us, challenge us, worry us, and futures that are not crystal clear. Like the people in the wilderness after they left Egypt, it can feel like we're on a long journey not knowing exactly where we're going. Like the people who endured under the oppressive Pharaoh, certainly there are things we have had to endure and suffer through. But given what we are given from God, and given that eternity is ahead, and given that we have Jesus Christ, what more can we possibly And perhaps what Jesus is saying to us in this gospel story this morning is that the what is it that we are looking for has already been given to us. Although the what is it that Jesus is talking about is not manna, but rather himself. I want to close this morning by just stating some words of a well-known hymn. I think they fit. Maybe we should have sung it, Paul. And these words will sound familiar, and these are just some excerpts from this hymn, but as I I state the words of this hymn, think about what more it is that we really could possibly need from God. Here are the words. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, and my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when strivings cease. My comforter, my all and all, here in the love of Christ I stand. And it goes on a little bit more. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ. I'll stand. What's the best present you ever received? I pray I never forget her answer. And I pray that each of us as followers of Jesus will live right now and tomorrow with hearts full of gratitude. Amen. And let us pray.